All right, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me today. I'm Dr. Catalina. And today I'm really wanting, um, I'm excited to have fellow clinicians and collaborators so that we can together begin to address sexual concerns after cancer for both cancer survivors and their partners. So today I really would like us, um, I hope that you leave this CE here today with an understanding of how cancer and its treatments impact sexuality, an appreciation of how prevalent sexual concerns after cancer actually are, strategies that clients can do to enhance their sexual well-being so that even if you don't know how to teach these, you certainly can refer them and inform them that there are options. And I hope you really, the goal of this is to really heighten your awareness of also recent efforts, um, including my research and others in this area. Sex after cancer definitely over the last decade has really broadened um, and opened up conversations and really starting to broaden how we address quality of life in cancer survivorship. And most of all, I hope that you leave today feeling empowered to integrate addressing sexual concerns into your clinical practice with cancer survivors and their partners. Acknowledging that everyone generally is affected by cancer in one way or another, either themselves or with their loved ones. And so hopefully again here today, I want to really provide a good background and context of this issue, but also address any concerns and natural and common barriers you may feel you have. So I really want to start us off by reminding ourselves, and this is not um, the unprecedented time that we are living in right now. And for cancer survivors, you know, the COVID when the COVID first started, a lot of my cancer patients are were saying, wow, I'm glad that, not glad, but they felt like they could now, other people who didn't have cancer finally understood what living with the uncertainty of cancer is and what that experience is like, not knowing how your body's gonna react, not knowing how your life changes. And now that we're several months into the pandemic, I put this up because I really think it's important for us to also think of the multiple layers that are going on for cancer survivors right now. And that at the forefront, fear of cancer recurrence is the number one concern cancer survivors will have after cancer as well as their partners. And that ends right when they finish their primary treatment. So this idea of this new normal, that term really was primarily used in cancer survivorship. But then when the COVID pandemic came about, you started hearing this more. So on one hand, this is normalizing cancer survivors experiences. And I really want to heighten awareness of the many layers in which cancer survivors experience their day to day. So an inherent in that, you know, right now you guys are experiencing this. We had to reschedule this a few times because of the pandemic, but most oncology care now, a lot of it, particularly for cancer survivors is um, being provided online. So unless people are getting scans and things like that, they'll even go and get their scans and their blood work, but they'll meet with their oncologist or their nurse practitioner for follow-up online. So outpatient cancer care has very much changed during this pandemic. And cancer survivors have very strong relationships with their cancer team. And cancer centers foster a really caring environment. So I really want to also highlight that that support isn't there. So it is with it if you are a therapist, a physical therapist, a physician, and not necessarily an oncologist, keeping this in mind of how now your role can actually, particularly if you are seeing patients in person, how how you can be a part of their cancer survivorship and particularly in addressing intimacy concerns. So 
let's start off by thinking about sex. And when we think of sex, one of the biggest things that oftentimes I want you to begin to think about what your brain starts thinking about. Oftentimes, most people think about sex as intercourse. And of course, particularly with this audience, I mean, and I think the Center for Healthy Sex very much has a more of a biopsychosocial um, paradigm in which we understand sex. But thinking about our sexuality and our sexual well being, particularly amongst during this time of isolation, is about connection and how we connect to others, how we walk into a room, how we actually share our feelings, how we look at each other, how we touch, how we communicate in and out of the bedroom with our partners and also with our loved ones. Our sexuality is at the core of our being. And that's really the paradigm in which I'm really wanting to present a lot of this work and really get you guys to start thinking about sex, okay? So again, sex is not just sex. It very much is an intersection of how our values, our communications, our body image, and I'll talk a lot about how that changes after cancer survivorship. Our personality, how we express ourselves, certainly within a socio-cultural context. So sexual concerns amongst cancer survivors are quite prevalent. Um, studies suggest that prevalence rates range anywhere from 40 to 100% of cancer survivors will experience some type of sexual change. Particularly when we're talking about your below the belt cancers, your gyne cancers, ovarian, uterine, endometrial cancers for women, as well as prostate, testicular for men, that's really where you're seeing prevalence rates of sexual changes really going above 90 to 100%. And one thing to keep in mind is, is, is that sex before cancer is already can be complex and as much fun as sex is supposed to be after cancer. These sexual changes are complex. And one of the most common um, examples of this complexity and how dynamic is, is really when we begin to look at physical symptoms and psychological symptoms interacting and then exacerbating one another. So an example of this is when we talk about vaginal pain for female cancer survivors. And I'll speak about this a little bit more, but a common occurrence um, is, is that many female cancer survivors will experience narrowing, tightening, shrieking, as well as dryness of their vagina. And so that can cause pain. And so when they experience pain, the first time they often engage in sexual activity, and particularly if they've been in a long-term relationship, they may go straight towards intercourse. And it does not take much pain to develop an aversive reaction. So what you then see is what happens when we become anxious and tense, when we experience pain, everything clenches. And so the pain gets exacerbated. And then you begin to see a loop as far as the pain exacerbating anxiety and then the anxiety generally leading to avoidance. And so then next thing you know, time goes by and as that anxiety continues to increase, as does the avoidance. So here we really see a dynamic process that fluctuates throughout cancer survivorship now, one of the things that we know is, is that oftentimes in cancer care, we don't bring up um, sexual concerns, even with below the belt cancers during cancer treatment, and particularly when treatment decisions are making. And a lot of that, I'll talk about some of those barriers, but unfortunately, oftentimes they're actually rarely brought up. Um, but one of the things that we do know is, is, is that the longer these sexual changes linger, 
the longer they generally are going to last. So, and sexual changes after cancer last generally the longest, particularly when they are occurring in conjunction with also long lasting symptoms such as fatigue and pain and distress. But there is some good news. We do know that with intervention, up to 70% of cancer survivors can improve their sexual well being. And that's where we want to manage expectations and actually open the doors to these conversations. So, one of the things is, is that unfortunately, when we talk about cancer, and particularly when we're talking about females, cancer survivors, oftentimes their partners get the shaft. And one of the things to keep in mind is, is that partners are affected by cancer as well. Cancer affects not just the patient, but the partner too. And what you see is, is that partners can experience as much, if not more, distress than the patient themselves. And you may ask why, and a lot of this is because can partners are generally the cancer, cancer patient's primary caregiver, but they are also often working, trying to be, trying to keep things up at home. If there's kids, they're assuming more caretaking and household responsibilities, while also particularly amongst male partners, maintaining a strong facade and also rarely asked how they're doing. Partners are much less likely to be offered or solicit support compared to the patients themselves. Keeping in mind, again, patients get to go in and see these nurses for infusions and radiation. And there's a lot of support in those interactions, but rarely do partners get that support. And what you see is similar to with patients. As patients' physical side effects increase, generally partners are going to report worsening, um, less frequent sexual activity, and poor satisfaction. But they'll also feel feelings of shame, self-blame, and sadness. Shame for even feeling guilty for even wanting sex or maybe ha changing their perceptions of their partner. Again, par partners see the patient body change so dramatically, but every day they're there for every moment of it. And that can be quite impactful. And so I've had soup many cancer survivors say, I wish my partner could actually talk to me about what it's been like for them to see me go through this, could talk to me about what they, how they're coping with my body changing so much, you know? But unfortunately, oftentimes these conversations don't happen. So again, changes amongst partners are often associated with the patient's physical impairments, their own fatigue with caretaking, and again, changes in their perceptions with the partner. So let's get into physical changes related to cancer and its treatment. And let's start with talking about women. So many women, because of chemotherapy, can be put into genitourinary syndrome of menopause, so early menopause. And symptoms of this include vaginal dryness, tearing, itching and irritation. And I hate this term, but it's often called vulvovaginal atrophy or vaginal atrophy. And when you think of atrophy, that's just such an awful way for us to think about our vaginas. But inherent in this, it is a lot of pain. And so women can also experience pain while urinating, urinating and also frequent UTIs. They can experience hot flashes as well as have actual complications or changes in sensitivity of due to surgical removal of their body part. And when we're thinking about these symptoms, one, keep in mind that with cancer, these 
changes are abrupt, okay? Cancer isn't, no, it's very hard to prepare for patients for this. You know, when we think about menopause, you know, that generally is going to be happening and we can prepare ourselves, pairing menopause. Now there's more awareness for this, particularly when we're talking about with AYAs, adult and adolescent um, cancer survivors who are under the age of 40, which is actually higher in prevalence now in Western countries. This is where a lot of these changes can have even more detrimental effects, particularly surrounding fertility and things like that. So some of the sexual implications for this are that women are going to experience decreased desire. Libido is gonna be one of the first things that's gonna be impacted. Pain during penetration and changes to their orgasms as if that wasn't hard enough. Now, patients may experience absent or muted orgasms. Now for men, Again, the number one concern that men have after cancer when it comes to sexuality is achieving and maintaining an erection. Um, and this is where they can also, because of their various treatments as, um, as including chemotherapy, radiation, as well as surgery, they cannot have permanent damage to their ability to maintain erections. But again, we'll talk about some of the medical advances that there are in treating some of this. Certainly men can have problems reaching orgasm. And one thing that often, particularly amongst prostate cancer survivors, that is rarely talked about and quite um, a surprise for many men is if they are able to engage in sexual activity, they experience dry ejaculate. And that's significant because for both the men and their partners, because ejaculation, similar to with women with vaginal lubrication, those are also indicators of, of arousal. And that gives your partner a, a, a tangible feedback of what your experience is. And so it's very, very startling and abrupt for patients when they first experience dry ejaculate. And then both for both women and men, incontinence during sex can be incredibly embarrassing and can certainly lead to avoidance. So here you really see avoidance and decreased libido being some of the main sexual implications. And really those are the coping strategies that many male cancer survivors apply when experiencing some of these physical changes. Of course, there are numerous emotional changes that affect our sexual well-being, keeping in mind that our brain is our largest sex muscle. So stress, and again, my first slide of looking at keeping in mind the daily stressors, particularly in the moment, whether those be economic, um, family, political, all of these things, there's so many layers within the cancer context. Certainly changes to body image and the number one emotional psychosocial concern amongst cancer survivors is fear and uncertainty of recurrence. So again, that's one of the biggest questions. The first question a cancer patient is going to ask themselves or ask their doctor when they're diagnosed is how long do I have? The last question, the first question that they're gonna have when they finish their treatment is if and when is it gonna come back? So, and that is a question that really can lead to a lot of anxiety and depression. The one thing that we, I want to keep in mind and really highlight here is, is that oftentimes, particularly clinicians will assume that all cancer patients are experiencing anxiety or depression. And while we expect a certain amount of emotional distress, it's important to know that only about 25 to 30%, depending on the cancer type and the severity of the illness of cancer patients are actually going to experience clinically significant levels of distress. 
And while that may be surprising, it's important to keep in mind that actually majority of people are resilient. And so again, you expect, particularly earlier on in treatment, that there is going to be some distress. But over time, generally most, most of your cancer patients are going to be able to adapt. This is where when we, particularly amongst those individuals who maybe experience some distress, if they're experiencing changes to their sexual well-being after cancer, then that's the trigger. And now after going through it for additional distress and because it lasts for so much longer and requires active coping strategies, this is where you can actually see it triggering then clinically significant levels of anxiety and, dep and depression. So the se sexual implications of this distress are certainly there are hormonal changes um, associated with our psychosocial um, functioning that affect our sexual response. Again, the number one sexual change you're gonna see is decreased libido. And certainly being distracted during sex, not being able to keep your head in the game, constantly thinking, it, you know, engaging and connecting with your partner in and out of the bedroom is about being present. And when cancer patients and their partners are constantly perseverating and worrying, then of course that's gonna have sexual implications. And so again, the number one thing that you see as far as how cancer survivors and their partners cope with these sexual changes is avoidance. Okay, so there's many models of how we look at the sexual, um, look at sexuality, but I put this side up here because I think it's really important to look at how cancer and um, its treatment and the implications of it can actually affect the various phases throughout our sexual response. So again, looking at how our psychosocial changes, but as well as fatigue, hormone imbalances, symptoms like nausea or mucositis, diarrhea, very much can affect desire. And, and then once, even if they want to have, um, have libido and they have a desire to engage in sexual activity, certainly distress can um, uh, impact arousal. Again, this is where you also are seeing vaginal chases, changes. So both lubrication and potency are gonna come up. And then the actual experience of during sexual activity, that's where again, you can have additional problems. And then with the orgasm, you can have delayed orgasm, muted orgasms. And then again, another lingering effect is postcoital pain or bleeding and then feeling ashamed and guilty after the sexual activity. Throughout the sexual response cycle, unfortunately, there's numerous opportunities for where the psychosocial and physical impacts of treatment can have um, show their mark. So the good news is, as I mentioned earlier, is, is that we know that there are strategies that can help manage these changes. Keeping in mind that our sexuality is going to evolve throughout time. In the context of cancer, that evolution may be more intense, more abrupt, more and last a lot longer and also be harder to cope with. So at the key of the majority of interventions is communication. Communication with your partners, as well as with your medical team. That's really what we try to encourage patients. When we can, we want to also treat both medically, physically, and psychosocially, the physical, the underlying causes that may be going on there. We want to try to minimize those anatomical changes. Again, this is what I'll go into use of vaginal dilators and we wanna provide as much symptom relief as we can. Again, the reality is, is that particularly keep, you know, thinking that cancer patients are within the medical system, they're within that medical model. And so 
they are wanting strategies that they can actually do that are looking to treat or cure their, their symptoms or these sexual changes. And so we're gonna talk a lot about that and how to manage their expectations. And certainly providing information and support around intimacy and alternative strategies, new ways for both giving and receiving sexual pleasure. And then as needed, you're gonna have about 20%, 10% of individuals who actually do require specialized treatment. And I'll go more into that. So now I'd like to just give an overview of what some of the treatment options are for both women and men. And I'm gonna start with, with vaginal pain um, at, because it is one of the most prominent and not talked about survivorship concerns amongst female cancer survivors. So one of one treatment options for vaginal dryness um, is vaginal moisturizers. Now these are non-hormonal over-the-counter products that can be used to really regulate um, there and stabilize natural pH levels to the vagina and to the vulva. And I very much recommend Replens for this. And what's important to keep in mind is, is that moisturizers are different than lubricants. Moisturizers have to be used regularly. So generally, um, doctors will recommend clients applying this to their area for several days a week and they'll have to do this regularly. And what they'll see is, is that if they stop, they may go back to what their levels were beforehand and experience those symptoms again. So this very much is an ongoing management strategy. Therein lies one of the biggest barriers with vaginal moisturizers is, is that it's hard and it's also expensive. It's about $30 a month to actually apply this regularly. So those are some of the barriers to keep in mind. Vaginal gel is another non-hormonal over-the-counter product. Again, really trying to improve overall vaginal health um, and very slightly different. Again, also I recommend it with, um, uh, recommend the brand of, of Replens with this. And really what it's trying to do is improving the tissues um, without also exacerbating irritation of the vaginal mucosa. So lubricants are what most women are um, going to go to first. And one of the, these are generally a liquid or a gel applied around the clitoris, labia, and inside the vagina to minimize dry, dryness. But this is done in the moment of engaging in sexual activity or using dilators or self-pleasure. Now, one of the things having worked with class, cancer survivors for a long time that I often hear particularly physicians and nurses recommend patients to use is Aquaphor. There are so many good lubricants out there that I do not recommend using Aquaphor. One, it's got petroleum jelly in it and two, it's super sticky and it is just not great to use. So, um, Definitely as far as lubricants and also I don't recommend KY. Many of my cancer survivors have said that it gets gooey. Um, this is really where go beyond CVS or your pharmacy. And there are so many lubricants online and actually encouraging your female patients to explore, test this out. Again, if they're not comfortable going into sex shops, getting samples or trying them, a lot of sex stores online will have a, a guarantee. I recommend Sudol to most of my clients because one, it's, it lasts a long time and with very little usage. But lubricants should always be around. I encourage patients to use it liberally. All right, I wanna introduce vaginal dilators. Um, and what vaginal dilators are, they're very similar to like those little Russian dolls where <laughs> one is inside of the other. And what they do are they're plastic tubes that start off in um, the first size is about the size of a finger and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And what the goal is, is, is that 
it's trying to stretch out and increase flexibility of the vagina. So particularly post-radiation or po um, oftentimes you got to wait till, both for particularly for gynae cancer patients, you have to wait until treatment um, has, that area has fully healed after radiation. But after treatment, what you want to do is encourage patients to actually use vaginal dilators with a ton of lube. And basically what they're going to do is they're going to initially insert it. And I actually encourage women to do this on their own, prepare for it, and also go at their own pace. So very much just even starting with the smallest one. And first, just kind of knocking on the door and getting used to even the touch of it. And then gently inserting into the vagina. And this is where if that's as far as they can go. If it's only a, a, up to their fingernails that much, that's fine. One of the most important things that we want to do is encourage relaxation and comfort with the vaginal dilator. So it's a bit of exposure. It can be very daunting and um, traumatic for patients to begin to even touch this area. Again, thinking of the aversions they may have developed. So really encouraging them to go at their pace. And this is where, why I recommend women do this on their own without their partner when they have time and in privacy. So really starting off slowly and then gradually working their way through. And then when they're ready, starting to make circles within their vagina. This is why I also recommend the dilators with handles on it um, so that they can begin to actually stretch. Um, so <clears throat> again, um, with these dilators, one of the things is that um, you gradually are building up confidence. And psychologically, what I also encourage patients to do is, is to really pair this, to begin to actually notice their sensations, heightening their sensations of what's going on there outside of just the pain, okay? Getting themselves relaxed before they begin to use the dilator, playing music, having nice candles, getting setting their environment so they have other cues there as well. Because as all of those cues can then be applied when they're resuming sexual activity. Okay, certainly kegels, pelvic floor exercises are also great for genital pain. What these do are enhan enhances pelvic control to begin to relax the vagina. It increases pelvic floor strength, um, arousal, and really the ability to focus on the pleasure of sex. And as a bonus for partners, um, they can also feel the vaginal movements on either their penis or their finger as well during sexual activity. So I just saw this one question. Um, uh, from my last slide, it says, these dilators look great, but I wouldn't have a clue how to teach my clients how to use them. Um, should I stay away from bringing that up as a strategy? Should I still bring it up as a strategy? And that's a great question. And I guess the number one thing I think with all of these things is, is really introduce it. Um, I have made a video, there's not great videos out there for the use of dilators, but um, in some of my research studies that I'll talk about, I've made some videos um, and I'm hoping to um, expand on the release of that, but definitely um, encouraging them to just go slowly, but also ask their doctor and talk to a physical therapist about how to use them. Again, you don't have to know all of the answers. What This is where collaboration and referral is important. All right, and I just wanted to talk about Mona Lisa Touch. Um, and because a lot of cancer survivors may ask about this as far as a strategy to manage genital pain. And what this is, is that this is a CO2 laser that delivers a small amount of thermal energy, um, injury to the vagina, vaginal tissue, which then really is trying to promote new growth of um, cells and collagen um, in the vagina. 
And this is generally given over three sessions. I'm sorry, six sessions that are about five minutes. So it's very quick. It doesn't generally hurt. However, it is fairly expensive um, and it does require maintenance. So it's not a one shot deal. The reality is, is that there haven't been any long term studies conducted with cancer survivors just yet. So at the moment, um, it isn't actually the FDA hasn't approved it for um, for GSM or vaginal pain, but this is a growing area. So what I generally do recommend is, is that cancer survivors speak to their oncologist um, and gyne gynecologist who specializes in working with cancer patients and is aware of um, vaginal dryness within this context for a little bit more information on that. All right. <clears throat> Hormone replacement therapy certainly is often a question that cancer survivors will ask when it comes to genital pain. And this is really where systemic estrogen isn't recommended um, in general for ER positive or estrogen receptor positive breast cancer patients. Um, the Mer American um, Association for Clinical Oncology Group rec does recommend that hormone therapy be a discussion that is collaborating um, in collaboration with the oncologist before any of this starts. So um, there really have been mixed results and no significant um, long-term treatments um, um, impacts of both estrogen, testosterone, and DHEA therapy um, amongst cancer survivors. So right now, really, a lot of what we're recommending is more of the behavioral strategies I just introduced, as well as um, some of these here, really planning for sex. Um, uh, does the speaker know of any petition to get the insurance to pay for Mona Lisa Touch? It is expensive. And, um, and this is actually, that's a great question. And that's one of the biggest barriers to it in the general population as particularly for cancer survivors. And no, at the moment, um, insurance does not cover it. Um, what you, and because it isn't um, generally recommended for cancer survivors just yet, and it's not as popular, um, there are, I don't know of any grants um, specifically for Mona Lisa Touch. Um, so unfortunately that is gonna be, and even if it does get FDA approved, that'll be a big barrier if it doesn't um, get approved, because again, it's, it has to be maintained. So other strategies are really to plan for sex. And this can feel very unsexy, but planning to not take dr drowsy medications ahead of time. Um, and really this is where mindfulness and connection are incredibly important. Important. Sensate focus, many of the, the therapists here, may hopefully maybe you know about that, but really that's one of the behavioral techniques that's um, been most efficacious in, um, in sex therapy of really getting the focus off of intercourse and heightening sensations and doing this across several steps and focusing on non-coital sexual activities in play and certainly trying different positions. This is really where not trying to put any kind of icing or bow on top of cancer because there's the reality is is that life changes and it is not often a pretty picture but really actually using this to appreciate your body and reconnect with it and also explore what your body prefers our bodies are going to evolve and their different positions are going to feel different all right, I want to quickly get to some of the treatment options for male erectile dysfunction. Um, oh, the lubricant that I mentioned before, and I think that um, uh, I mentioned it in, um, I will give these slides, is called Pseudal. Um, one of the questions here was, could you spell the name of the lubricant? And it's called S-U-T-I-L, Sutil. And you can actually go to Pleasure Chest or go to Sutil.com. I, I think you can go to Sutil.com, but, but you can definitely get it at Pleasure Chest. And again, it's I think it's like $26 or something like that. And it that, that $26 will last a few months. Um, it's pretty good. All right. So the number one go-to for male erectile dysfunction is 
is, is that people are going to get prescribed Viagra, Cialis. Um, those are the main, the two most popular. And uh, thank you, perfect. Um, and unfortunately, particularly when there's a big psychological component and anxiety and aversion to sex, that's where oftentimes you don't see Viagra and Cialis working very much. And so oftentimes you'll have male cancer survivors already be hesitant if they hadn't used these in the past to try it a couple times and then still not be able to have an erection. And so then they'll give up, they'll get frustrated and then they'll just give up. And that's where it's really important because again, most class, males cancer survivors are getting this from their GP. So they're not talking about it. Okay, this and this question here, um, someone said was most of the men I see are getting pills from their GPs, try them once and give up. <laughs> think, think, um, I'm not convinced they're effective, particularly if there's low desire. So that's very much, um, it doesn't help that these pills don't help very much. So this is really where I recommend that you do more psychotherapy and support around the anxiety, around those cognitions um, surrounding their sexuality and addressing those and then building them up to then better get connected with their bodies before they begin to use those. I'm not saying they don't work, but you really got to address um, the psychological factors first um, to actually be get them to a point where the arousal is there and that they're able to be more present, okay? Because if the anxiety is there, they're going to be too in their in their head and the Viagra and Cialis generally won't work as well. Penile pumps are often recommended, but one thing um, is important to remember is, is that penile pumps are used as a rehabilitative tool, meaning that oftentimes people will think, oh, okay, um, the pump will get me super hard and then I'll be able to have sex immediately. Generally, when we're talking after cancer, you're going to want to be our male cancer survivors are going to want to use these penile pipes, pumps uh, to strengthen, get the blood flow going, their erections outside of the bedroom, outside of that sexual activity on their own. Um, and then they can gradually begin to build up their the strength of their erection. And then that's actually what's going to help them improve their function. Penile injections, while they may be daunting, um, and men think their initial thought is, I'm going to inject my penis, um, actually are some of the most effective for erectile dysfunction. Um, for, and so they can, men can have multiple orgasms with them. They generally last 45 to an hour and a half. Um, so they are very initially averse, but once you get men to be open to it and have good experiences with them, they generally will actually keep on using them. And Kegels, certainly, rarely are they talked. Kegel exercises are rarely recommended to men, but certainly they also help strengthen their pelvic floor, which improves erection strength and enhances longevity. And when you think about engaging their and, um, sexual energy and harnessing that, again, when men are able to begin with their core and engage that, that's actually going to harness that sexual energy and also get them to be more present and feel in more control. Certainly it helps with incontinence as well. Okay, now let's get to really the gap. Unfortunately, there's a big gap between the patients who need the support and the patients who actually get it. And the main reason of this is, is because both patients and clinicians are unaware of what actually is available and also who to refer to. Even in big cities like LA, New York, or Chicago, it's very, um, oftentimes it's really hard to know who are the physical therapists to refer to for pelvic floor exercises. A lot of oncologists, a lot of gynecologists, urologists don't actually address a lot of these concerns, which is very surprising. Certainly embarrassment, both on the patient's part of not wanting to talk about it with their doctor and as well as the provider's part. And I'll talk more about that. 
And then unfortunately, again, lack of engagement with partners. They often aren't getting addressed or nor are they included in the treatment plan. Um, and then those are our big barriers. So a lot of my research in the past looked at where um, cancer survivors sought support. And again, what you can see is a lot of people are getting this online and reading articles. And again, that's where they're getting a lot of this support. So it's really important to heighten this awareness. And as clinicians, you guys can begin to just open, heighten their awareness by just bringing it up. And we'll talk about that. So, um, and what they're typically doing, most people aren't doing anything. Again, lubricant is generally most, um, this was a study we did with about 300 breast cancer survivors and most of them, what they were doing was using lubricants. Um, so I really wanna quickly just give you guys some information about a web beat rape based resource that um, I developed with my colleagues at University of Sydney. And we got a grant um, from the Australian Research Council, which is similar to NIH here, where we developed a web-based research call, resource called Rekindle to address sexual concerns for both patients and their partners. And it was for both um, women and men, as well as same-sex attracted and heterosexual individuals. So it was highly tailored. Um, and had 12 different versions. And that at the core of this really were our ambassadors sharing their stories. And I just wanted to give a very human element, share this with you guys so that you can, um, these were some of yeah, my more, favorite um, um, ambassadors. Particular about incontinence than the sexual activity. Yeah, so the incontinence is a big thing. Yeah. That, that's improved too. It has, but it's an ongoing, Thing in terms of um, going to the toilet a lot, that's a big thing because my bladder shrunk down. So I might go to the toilet, well, I used to go maybe twice a day. I might go six times a day. So it's not that I'm going into the men's toilet for, um, hey, let's have a look. It's actually because I've got to empty my bladder. <laughs> and that's for the audience, that one. All right. Good he point. weed on me once. Once. Because when he ejaculates, nothing comes out. But um, this yeah. one time he urinated on me, which I really didn't like. But, you know, well, what happened was the bladder, there it. must have been some urine in the bladder. So through uh, <laughs> the, the point of ejaculation, uh, which there's no semi-fluid, but the feeling is exactly the same, um, some urine came out. <laughs> some, a lot. Which I thought, I thought at that particular moment, oh my gosh, the semen's back. This is fantastic, um, but uh, no, it's been a year on. But the sensation was more fulfilling for sure. And so really what, what we also, um, really the ambassadors, and I think this is really something important for clinicians to know is, is that things like support groups and um, uh, really, can be very normalizing and empowering for patients to first and foremost know that they are not alone in addressing um, and having these sexual changes. So Rekindle had a lot of different videos to dispel myths and um, we had a lot of different activities. Um, we had a treatment decision there based on what some of their priorities were. And really what we saw was is that improved sexual satisfaction, their sexual self-disclosure, um, as well as they reported less um, unmet needs regarding sexual concerns. We got a lot of positive feedback for, from that. And um, one of the questions is, is that how can clients access that? So that was part of a government grant that we did um, in Australia. And from that, I'm actually also currently running um, and testing. I tailored that for specifically Latina cancer survivors to develop the first sex therapy for Latinas called Aviva. And we're testing that. But right now, these are only accessible in, um, in uh, these studies. But parts of a lot of, in my own practice, what I'll be doing is actually integrating a lot of the teachings that I developed for these interventions in some online courses. So check out my website for some of that. All right, so now I'd really like to focus on the takeaways for clinicians of how to begin to integrate 
addressing sexual concerns in your clinical care with, again, both cancer survivors as well as their partners. Again, remember, why don't clinicians access this? The number one thing they say is time. But again, embarrassment, lack of knowledge, a lot of assumptions about the patients because they're old or because they're single. Your own personal schema around sex. Um, and again, not knowing the answers and not knowing who to refer to. All of those are common. So if you're a clinician here that is, hasn't really ever addressed this and you're experiencing some of these, no, it's very, very common. So what we did within the Rekindle study was we looked at, um, we used the Promise Sexual Function and Satisfaction Measure, um, which is um, one of the most used sexual function measures. And what we took out of that was the global satisfaction with sex scale, which is seven items. And what we did when we did a confirmatory analysis with about 280 cancer survivors was that we found that one question actually accounted for the majority of the variance of, um, of correlating it with distress as well as function and overall health. And that question was, how sexually satisfied are you? And so when we're thinking about the number one constraint that particularly physicians will say of why they can't bring up sexual concerns, what I train physicians to do is ask that one question, how sexually satisfied are you? And how that then opens the door for assessment and begins to first and foremost, normalize for your patient that you can talk about this here and that I'm someone you can talk about this with, but then also will give you a holistic assessment of their physical and psychosocial well being. So, how do you raise these concerns? Keep in mind, when we're talking about addressing these, you are using the same effective communication skills that you do already are using in your practice. Um, Make sure that you're having the first discussions with your patient in private. Um, these are hard discussions to, particularly if their partners are often with them in their meetings with physicians. Um, so really raising these initially in private. Um, and again, when you raise it, it immediately normalizes it. So you're opening the door to the conversation. Ask if the partner needs to be involved in discussions or if they want them to. And then really make sure that you are timing your discussions according to where they are in treatment. Don't make assumptions of what patients know. Don't make assumptions that if someone was, is in their 20s and 30s and has cancer, that they actually were talked about, um, were spoken to about fertility. A lot of patients, unfortunately, aren't. So one of the things when we're thinking about communication and how we intervene regarding sexual concerns, the leading model, even though it's older, that still guides this work is the Plicit model. And really starting off with first asking permission um, and then providing some information and normalizing that and then giving some specific suggestions. And then again, only for about 10% will people need a specific referral to either a psychologist or therapist that specializes in sexual concerns um, after cancer or a physical therapist or occupational therapist. So some questions that you may want to ask are, you know, particularly if you're a physician, now that we've talked about how you're managing at home after treatment, I'd like to ask some questions about how things are going with your sexual relationship. Is that okay with you? Um, or you're making a good recovery from treatment. Um, from now on, it should be possible for you to resume most of your normal activities when you feel able. Again, many patients, particularly if they are did have um, either particularly breast cancer patients or prostate cancer patients, gynae cancer patients, they may not think, they may think that that's a no-go zone now. So really normalizing that, you know, particularly if you are a physician, that they can actually have that. Going by the Plizit model, really, and I have a few minutes left, um, actually beginning with, I'd like to review how you're doing, would that be okay? Normalizing and assessing, again, changes to sexuality after cancer are common. How sexually satisfied are you? 
And just by that, those two sentences, that already normalizes and opens the conversation. Okay. And then specific suggestions could be maybe saying after radiation, vaginal dryness and narrowing and tightening is common. Using vaginal dilators with lubricants can help. Again, you don't have to know how to use dilators, but you can normalize that this is common and also say there's something that can help so that they can then get that information. Then if you see that they are experiencing more distress or they have questions that you can't answer, then you can say, you know what? I think you'd benefit from additional support to address your vaginal pain and incontinence. Can I refer you to my colleague who specializes in this? So this is a really a model of how you can begin to integrate this in your practice. Really the schedule is it's important for you to give up-to-date information. Again, like things with the Mona Lisa and the insurance keeping aware of that, of what's the research in that and what's changing with insurance so that you can provide that information. Normalizing with prevalence data, um, discussing how this actually impacts their partners as well. Modeling clear, confident conversation, communication so that they, that reduces the stigma or embarrassment they may have in talking about sexual concerns. Using testimonials, um, or speakers to show this um, and giving examples of previous patients you may had and maybe bringing them, particularly for group settings, bringing them in, really figuring out what strategy works best for you and whether it be in group settings or in your individual work, really figuring out how you can begin to integrate this. Some of the things to keep in mind is really work from a biopsychosocial framework. I've got one more minute. And to normalize that sexuality is not just intercourse, that it is experience in and out of the bedroom, reducing the pressure on performance and orgasm, and normalizing that communicating about it is challenging or can be challenging. But most of all, as clinicians, checking yourself, being aware of your own sexual schemas and your own awareness about your own sexuality and how that plays a role in your clinical care. Be aware of your own biases and comfort in discussing and really explore this and practice with colleagues and friends. Really keeping in mind that sexual changes may have appeared suddenly, but require acknowledgement, adjustment, and ongoing practice. Sex gym is necessary. It is a dynamic process. Our sexuality evolves. Normalize those challenges to practicing. Normalize that it's fluid and that sometimes something else may happen. They may get sick in some regard and that may actually impact their sexuality again. Explore strategies of how they can communicate with their partners, do role plays, and very much appreciate, and again, makes normalizing statements of the socio-cultural factors that impact how they can communicate, how they can assert their needs sexually. And really, again, going to your other information that you know about your patient, based on your working relationship with them and integrating that into your work addressing sexual concerns. And most of all, managing both your own and your client's expectations. All right, so I really want to um, really leave you with the empowering you to start the conversation. Sexual concerns are common and we really need to begin to normalize these and empower clients to reassert and prioritize their sexual well-being because that is their life force. Relationships and connections, we are essential for well-being and for our health. And so we all deserve this and particularly after cancer, it doesn't need to take away this too. So. 
Again, feel free to reach out to me um, on my website at www.drcatalina.org, or you can follow me on Instagram at drcatalina underscore. And thank you so much. Good luck to everybody. Thank you for prioritizing sexuality, particularly amongst individuals and their partners impacted by cancer. Take care.